We've learned so far that the law of the Spirit has set us free from the law of sin and death. Look at your neighbor and say, that's good news. You know, and, you know, we remember, you know, we realize that just like laws of gravity, the law of spirit, it brings life. Like gravity keeps us down to earth, the spirit gives us life. It just happens, right? And uh, also, if you run past second base and you get caught, then the game's over. That's the law of baseball, unfortunately, for the Dodgers last night. We also found that the mindset on the spirit brings death okay the set up being set on the flesh brings death spiritually and physically for always focused on fleshly things on self being selfish it brings physical death and ultimately spiritual death if our mind is set on the flesh and we've been contrasting these two ideas because the mind set on the spirit brings life and peace how many know what i'm talking about it just changes the way you live it changes the way you live and I've been thinking about this this week as I've been learning how to teach second graders and doing all these different things. You know, I'll find myself all of a sudden a little glum and I'm thinking, wait, what, am I, what is my mindset on? You know, it's like a quick self-check, right? What am I thinking about? You know, what am I thinking about right now? And then I shift gears and I think about, wow, I'm really thankful that I don't have to spend gas to go to the school anymore. I, I'm at home. I can go and see my family. after ele- I only Zoom from 8 to 11. And then after that, it's just a matter of getting schoolwork done. I mean, and then, you know, you start to, God wants us to think of those things that are good, Philippians 4, 8, right? That are praiseworthy and just and lovely. And you start to think well and your body follows your good thoughts your mind follows your good thoughts your spirit begins to be lifted just by being grateful it's amazing how it works today we're going to continue to look at the spirit within us that's bringing us life and find that this wonderful reality will truly encourage us so let me pray before we get going lord i i thank you for your word I thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit that lives in us, that teaches us, instructs us, and guides us. I pray, Father, that your Spirit will illuminate the Word and help us apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been reading the first verses of chapter 8. Let's go ahead and start again and read up to where we left off last time I stopped in the middle of this message. Verse, beginning with cha- uh, verse 1 of chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That, underline that one. You will need that many times in your life. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, For it is not even able to do so. We talked about that last week. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So let's move to the next verses. Verse 9. However, however, comma, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. Paul's basically saying here, you're Christians. So you have the Holy Spirit. You are not controlled by the sinful nature. We've been looking at that in Romans 6. You are reckoning yourself dead to sin and alive in Christ. You have power over sin. You can say no to sin. So you're not controlled by the sinful nature like those who don't know Christ. They can't help but sin. Be encouraged. So if you have the Spirit within you, that's evidence that you're a child of God. We've been talking about that. How many, know what I, how many just know they're different now that they're born again? No one can argue against that. You, against that. you know in your, 
your spirit testifies to your spirit. And, we, you know, that's what it says in Galatians. We can cry out, Abba, Father, right? Because we're a child of God. If you don't have the spirit of Christ, you don't belong to him. Okay, that's how you can tell. Well, if you've never sensed any kind of change inside you, then maybe you're not truly born again. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3.3, 3, when he asked about this, he said, Truly I say to you, unless a man is born again, he will not see the kingdom of heaven, will not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is an important fact. You can't just believe. You need to receive Christ. He comes into our life. We become a new creature in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17, and that's when all this starts to happen. You can't just muster it up and act like a Christian in the flesh. It won't last long. I tried years ago for a couple of years to be like a Christian in the flesh. And I kept falling and kept doing all the things I always did between church services. Till I finally surrendered and asked for His Holy Spirit to come into my life. And then all of a sudden I was good to go. I had that Spirit in me, the Spirit within me, to live like Jesus and to love people. That's what we talk about all the time here. When you turn your life over to Jesus and His Lordship, then you are born again. You become a new creature in Christ. So, that leads me to number four. We went over the first three, um, the first three last week in your notes. So we're jumping right over to four. The first three said that the spirit of the law, uh, the law of the spirit, says free from the law of sin and death. The mindset on the flesh brings death. Number three, when you're being controlled by the power of the Holy Spirit within you, you have peace. And now, number four, you know the Spirit is within you if you live a Spirit-controlled life. You know the Spirit is within you if you live a Spirit-controlled life. Look at 1 John in the back of your Bible. 1 John 2, 3 through 5. 1 John 2. 2, 3, through 5. First John is a no-nonsense book. It gets right to it to see if you really are in Christ. First John 2, verse 3 through 5. By this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. The one who says, I have come to know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps His word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in Him. See that right there? Gets right to it. And then chapter 3, verse 6. No one who abides in Him sins. No one who sins has seen Him or knows Him. Now, of course, we talked about this in Romans 7. We do what we don't want to do, and what we do want to do, we don't. Because we still have this flesh, right? But what it's talking about is someone who practices sin. What is your life characterized by? If you're truly in Christ, you're going to stop sinning. You're going to want to stop sinning. So my question right now to all of us, and me included, do you find yourself obeying the Lord? Do you find yourself wanting to please God every day? Do you find yourself living a peaceful life? Do you find yourself loving God and loving your neighbor? Do you find yourself living with increasing amounts of self-control, patience, and kindness? Do you want to share your faith? If you do, that means that you have the Spirit within you. That's a good litmus test. That means the Spirit is within you. It is not normal <laughs> to want to do all those things. You understand? If you don't know Christ. That means you're born again. That's what the Scripture says right here. If you have a, a life being controlled by the Spirit, it's evidence of you being born again and being in Christ. You know, I, it just, you just can't help but share what God has done for you, whether you have the gift of evangelism or not. You're just going to want to share God's love and be loving to people, even if you don't use words. You know, uh, last week after y'all all left, that status, you know, all of y'all, right? Um, I, I went surfing, and it, I'm usually talking to Otz up there, catching up on the latest stuff, and then slowly the wind is picking up and getting more choppy, and I'm, I'm dying to surf, you know? But I love talking to Otz, so I finally went surfing after we had our conversation, and I just I went down to the edge of the water, and I thought, you know, Lord, who do you, 
I just want to go lead someone to the Lord. I just, you know, if that's not normal, if you're not a Christian, why would you want to do that? I mean, it's a sunny day. Why would you want to go out and risk, you know, being socially awkward and bringing up Christ in the water? But I can't help but just do this because the Spirit is within me, right? So I, I sat down there and stretched and prayed, you know, went out in the water. And this, there was this 12-year-old right next to me. I could tell he's one of my people because I've been teaching sixth grade for 25 years. I'm thinking, he's one of my people group, right? And I just started talking to him, and I just felt like the Holy Spirit said, just ask him if he knows how to get to heaven. And so I just stepped out and said, hey, man, can I ask you a question? He said, what? Do you know how to get to heaven? He said, no. I said, well, don't you think that's kind of important? Because, you know, when you die, you're going to go somewhere, Right? He said, okay, and he started, you know, when they stop and actually listen to a, an old guy with a, with a beard and gray hair, you know that that must be a God thing, because why would he listen to some old guy, right? But he's listening to me, and I shared with him, I said, well, you know what, if Jesus, I said, no one's good enough to go into heaven, so Jesus died on the cross for you, so if you put your trust in him, and I said it in 12-year-old words, then if you ask Jesus to come into your heart, then you will know that you go to heaven when you die. And I said, would you like to know that you're going to heaven? As his little nine-year-old brother is paddling up, he said, okay. I'm like, wow, really? Just like that? Okay, okay. So I sat there and prayed with Keller out there, and he received Jesus into his young life. I mean, it's a seed planted. We don't know that he's suddenly going to go to church and be on a worship team, you know, all that, read his Bible. And turn, but, but it's a seed planted. He's, it's his entrance into his salvation, right? Praise the Lord. I was so excited. I, I looked at him. I said, you know, it is so cool to be surfing, and the waves are really fun. Um, and, uh, but, and then to lead someone to Christ is just bonus. I was so excited for him. I was like, yes, Keller. You're, you're a child of God. You're, the angels right now are throwing a party for you, Keller. And then there, was, so then there was a girl with this floppy hat, and she was trying to get up on her knee first and then stand up. And I'm thinking, should I witness to a girl? I don't know, but she really needs help surfing. She's trying to get up on her knee first, and that, how many knows that doesn't work? By the time you get up on one knee and then the other knee, and then you try to get up on your feet, you're all the way to the beach, and you just crash. So... I said, you've got to just pop up to your feet. She said, I know, I know, it's just so hard. So anyway, so one thing led to another, and I just said, you know, we actually have a church in here that meets here, and today we're talking about, you know, the whole, how the Spirit of God actually lives with us. And she was older. She was in her 20s probably. And I started talking about the Lord and this and that. I said, what's your name? Her name is Sierra. I said, you know, Sierra, would... I, I just got to ask you this question because someone did it for me. Would you like to know that you're going to go to heaven when you die? And she thought about it real hard and she said, sure, I'd like to do that. I said, wow. I said, this is incredible. I've only been out here for like 20 or 30 minutes and God is immediately answering my prayers. So over here, Sierra closed her eyes on her board and just said this sincere prayer. Dear Jesus, come into my life. I want to put my trust in you. I'm going to follow you. I'm sorry for my sin. Forgive me. And she opened her eyes, and I was like, wow, that is amazing, Sarah. This, you're the second person I've prayed with in the last 20 minutes. And she was so excited. And just, I, I just lifted up my hands and I said, Sierra, God, is, their angels are parting for you. They're so excited because you gave your heart to Christ. And that happened, Keller over here and Sierra over there. I mean, and we were, I was getting, and then I got this bomb left right after that. And uh, I went all the way to the beach. Kate, thanks for letting me use your board. And uh, she, I didn't ask her actually. And uh, so I'm sorry, forgive me. And then, so I came to the beach and this guy said, wow, that was a really good wave. And then, so I was like over the moon, you know, catching great waves, leading people to Christ. Why does that happen? Because the spirit was in, was within me and I can't help but do that. You understand what I'm saying? And it's so fun. Praise the Lord. You know, the spirit is within you. If you have a spirit controlled life and a spirit led life. And I'm so grateful to know that I'm going to go to heaven. And if the Spirit of God is within you, you can also look forward to great, for great things to come. Not just what's happening now, but great things to come. Because as we're singing in the song, as we raise a hallelujah, that we're going to beat death. Guys, think about this for a second. 
Just close your eyes and think about it the day that you're dying. You're laying on your bed. You close your eyes and then you're going to open them and be in the presence of the Lord. I mean, just have we really thought about that lately? I was thinking about this yesterday as I watched the Longhorns give up in the second half and the Dodgers lose it in the ninth. I was thinking, but wait, I have great things to come. No, we are going to close our eyes one day and we're going to open them up and be in the presence of the Lord. This is a crazy, crazy truth. It is so real. And and it's really hard for us to wrap our mind around it because it's all about the physical, isn't it? But this is a reality. We're going to beat death and rise again, and you're going to have a resurrected body. Look at verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Let me say that again. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in you. He's going to give us life now and forever with Him. Forever with Him. I love that. So, that leads me to point five. The Spirit dwelling within us is a guarantee that we will be resurrected. That we'll be resurrected. Look at 1 Corinthians 6.14. 1 Corinthians 6.14. It could be called 1 Californians. But uh, so 1 Corinthians 6, 14. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. And then in chapter 15 in 1 Corinthians 15, go over to there, verse 20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came by death, a man also came to the resurrection of the dead. And then in verse 23, But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and after that, those who are Christ, who are Christ at his coming. And then in 2 Corinthians 4.14, it reads, We'll start with 13. But having the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we also speak knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. And then Philippians 3, verse 20. Look at Philippians 3, verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly await for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. And then then finally in 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 through 17, right before Hebrews, after Timothy... Wait, here we go. No, before Timothy. 1 Thessalonians 4... 17, starting with verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and will remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. This is beautiful news, you guys. We don't have to fear death. We're going to rise again. We're going to rise again. One boy was heard saying, When I die, I hope it's peacefully in my sleep like Grandpa, not screaming in terror like his passengers. So, no, but seriously, on a more serious note, on a more serious note, 
My grandparents had a private plane in 1948. I mentioned this before another time, and they were flying from Houston to Abilene, and they were in a thunderstorm, and the pilot got uh, vertigo, we believe, and flew straight into the ground, and my both my grandparents died in 1948 in their plane. And so my mother had to reckon with death as a 16-year-old. I mean, just picture like Mary's age, and all of a sudden, parents are gone. So she spent years trying to reckon with it, and uh, she came to Christ, and she was ready to meet Jesus my whole, my whole life as a, when I was old enough to understand. She couldn't wait to be with, in heaven to be with her parents. She had no fear of death. In fact, right towards the end when she was dying, she just couldn't wait to go be with Jesus. She'd say, you know what? I just need to go be with Jesus. I, I'm just, her body was so banged up. She had no fear of death. She had absolutely no fear of death. And... Uh, so that's encouraged me as a young person and she would go her ministry was to go to families that were bereaving um, in corpus christi and she would go to their homes and help them deal with death because she was able to 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 grapple with her loss of her parents and that's what she did as a ministry and so when i get an airplane i also have that you know it's wild because i had that background with my grandparents but i i have this because I heard of a missionary story years ago where these missionaries were going to, uh, the men were going to check out their field before they went there and they left their wives and children behind. They, they, were, they actually were in a plane crash and they were killed, these missionaries, and their wives wanted to know, why did our husbands die? I mean, Lord, what is your plan? You know, because that's not, that was not in our plan, obviously, right? Well, they apparently, from what I heard, this is in, when I was in YWAM, Youth of the Mission, I heard this story. They got the black box and they could hear their husbands leading the plane in worship as it hit the ground. I mean, wow. And obviously it was different for their wives and their children from that point forward, but their husbands led these people into heaven as they crashed. And so when I get on the airplane, I see the airplane like a church. And you have the aisle, and you have all the congregants in their seats. And my plan is just to run to the front if there's still while there's time and turn around and lead everybody to Christ so that right before we hit, everybody will just kind of go kaboom and then right to Jesus. Right? So when I get on the airplane, I, I know that all my days are ordained before one of them came to be, Psalm 139. I know that in Psalm 121, he watches to my comings and goings, both forevermore, now and forevermore. I know from Psalm 91:11, he puts his angels charge over me to watch me in all my ways. But I also know that it might be my last day. And if it is, it's going to be okay because his spirit lives within me. Amen. And that spirit will not die. Amen. It's going to go straight to be with Jesus. You know, my dad, I've mentioned this year before, but it's been a while. My dad was driving like Kate on the way to Mammoth and back this weekend. He was tired and she almost fell asleep. Praise God you all didn't. Uh, they went up and back for a photo shoot. They're crazy, but they got their picture anyway. So, but my dad was driving, he was working the oil business in Midland, Texas. He was tired. He fell asleep and he was going off the road when he woke up and he jerked the wheel and it rolled the car. He got thrown out of the car because back then there was no air conditioning, so you had your windows down in the 50s. He landed on his head in a field, split his head open, broke his neck, and he was in a coma for several months. And so he remembers at one point his body came out, his spirit came out of his body, and he was hovering above the hospital, and he could see his his the doctor by his bedside and his friends coming in the door. And then he went back in. But he didn't tell us that till he was older because he didn't want to seem like, want us to think he was crazy. But my dad would not make that up. And so we're spirit beings, right? And the Holy Spirit's living in us. And one day we're going to get out of this car that we're driving around in life. Our eyes are like the windshield. We're driving around in life. I still feel like the same guy surfing out there as I was when I was 18. But then I look in the mirror and I know I'm not. But that's because I'm still the same guy in my car. And one day I'm going to get out of my car <laughs> and they're going to put my car in the ground, but I'm going to be gone, right? And so 
I know that death is not the end. It's just transition. It's only the beginning. We're going to be raised up with Christ. This spirit within us that we're reading about in Romans 8 is evidence of this truth. We're going to rise after we die. Look at Matthew 27, 52. Matthew 27, 52. That'd be a good football play. I could hear a quarterback going, Matthew, 27, 52. <laughs> oh my gosh, why did I think of that? I watch a lot of football. Anyway, Jesus cried out with a loud voice on the cross, yielded up his spirit. His spirit came out, right? And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs were open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. So, there's one of the first resurrections right there. Right there. Okay? The disciples had this example of the first fruits of what Jesus was talking about. They got to see these guys. Ellicott says, many think it's probable that they were persons who had died, but lately perhaps such as had believed in Christ. So in other words, it's possible that these are people that the disciples had just seen come to the Lord and died. And so they rose as this immediate evidence of what they've been learning from Christ. Whoever they were, their resurrection was a most extraordinary event and doubtless was much, most, was much spoken of in Jerusalem among those to whom they appear. Can you imagine? Everybody in Jerusalem was talking about it. And it's not improbable that Christ's prophecy recorded in John 5.25 referred to this. Look at John 5.25. John 5.25. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. So this could be referring to that event. And it is, prob it is probable that as they were undoubtedly raised to immortality, they attended their risen Savior. So in other words, as they rose, they were immediately with Christ. We know the Word says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord as he was still on the earth, and then afterwards accompanied him in his ascension to grace his triumph over death and the grave and all the powers of darkness. Look at Ephesians 4.8. Ephesians 4.8. Ephesians 4.8 reads, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. So these are the sum of those that went with him. And then in Colossians 2.15. Colossians 2.15. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. So this is a public display of his victory a public display of him disarming the powers of the darkness by these res the resurrection of the dead. Thus, as the rending, Ellicott goes on, thus as the rending, the veil of the temple intimated that the entrance into the most holy place, the type of heaven, was now laid open to all nations. So as the veil was torn, showing that we all could enter into Christ, into be with God, because Christ is now our, our high priest, so the resurrection of a number of saints from the dead demonstrated that the power of death and the grave was broken, praise God. That the sting was taken from death, that the victory rested from the grave, and if they ascended with him too, it was thus shown that the Lord's conquest over the enemies of mankind was complete. It was finished. And he said that at the cross, didn't he? To Telestai, it is finished. And not only an earnest given of a general resurrection of the dead, but of the kingdom of heaven being open to all believers. You know, I've done three or four funerals, and every time I've done a funeral, I've given an altar call, and there's no better opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus than in the cemetery. 
And what I like to show is as they're looking at the coffin right there, I tell them one day the dead are going to rise. That this cemetery is going to come alive. The tombs came open. We read that in Matthew 27, 52, hut, right? We just read that, that the tombs are open and they came out. So one day everybody's going to rise and meet Christ in the air. And when I've said that at three different funerals, I've had people give their lives to Christ right there on the spot because they get it finally. We need to know this by reading about it and taking a moment to really think about the fact that we're going to die and where are we going to go next. It's reality. Right now, people are dying over, all over the world and they're either, either going to heaven or to hell. If you have the Spirit dwelling in you, that is a guarantee that you're going to be with Christ and you will be resurrected as a resurrected body one day. That's good news, isn't it? And it will not have an expiration date on it, right? Like we have on our milk. Our new body will have no expiration date. So how do we know that we have the Spirit within us? By the Spirit-controlled life. So... As the worship team comes up, I just want to say, if you're not experiencing the Spirit-controlled life, and you believe, and you need to be, you believe that you need to be born again, I just want to give you guys a chance right now, okay? Because I just want to say, I'm, and I'm not here to judge anybody, but I was in church for a couple of years, back in the 80s, and I don't think I was born again yet. And... Uh, I believe that the seed was planted in my life to believe. I believe that the people that witnessed to me, my mother and her unconditional love, was, had planted a seed in me. But I had not given man Jesus my Lord. And John 1.12 says to believe and receive. To believe and receive. It's one thing to believe, it's another thing to receive. And I say this a lot, but I think it's so important. Because the obvious result of this is we will have the spirit controlled life and then we'll bear fruit because it's not about us is it i mean we're going to get saved that's the good news you're going to go to heaven but we have things to do here on earth there's other surfers out here like keller and sierra right now that are just waiting for a conversation right they're just waiting for a conversation at the grocery store today or like um, the guy went at the grocery store last night i took out my bank on christ card and I asked him if that would work at Ralph's. He said, no, that's, I'm sorry. It says, it says good through eternity. <laughs> he said, no, you're going to have to have another card. But it was a chance to witness to him, right, with my little card that I have. It looks like a Bank, on a Bank of America card. There is opportunities to share Christ right now that are waiting for us. And so let's all close our eyes right now. And there could be somebody with an earshot that has been believing, they've heard about Jesus their whole life, but they've not taken that step to say, Jesus, I want to follow you. Come into my heart with your spirit. I want to have that spirit-controlled life. I want to have peace in my life. I want to have power in my life. I want to have victory over sin. I want to be able to love my enemies. I want to be able to bear fruit at my job. I want to be able to, to be kind to my neighbors, to, to love my wife or my husband or my kids like you can love. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand right now and I want to pray with you. Okay. I know most of y'all here and most of y'all are born again, but there could be somebody that's raising their hand in, inside their heart and they don't want to talk, be uh, public right now. So let's all pray together this prayer that we've all prayed before. Say, Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Thank you for going to the cross and dying for me, paying for my sins. I know you rose again. I believe that in my heart. And I believe I will rise again with you if I believe in you. So I give you my life. Come into my heart. I make you my Lord. Fill me with your spirit and give me the power to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, Lord. Woo! Amen.
That is what life is all about, you guys. The spirit-filled life. You know, hear people talking about, oh, that church is spirit-filled. That's the, those are those fanatics. No, that means the spirit is alive in them, and that's why they're so demonstrative. That means that's why they're worshiping with their hands raised, and they're being fools for Christ. It doesn't mean they're fanatic. It just means they're in love with Jesus. That's why I love to call myself a Jesus freak. I'm not ashamed. Right? So let's stand up and give the Lord glory and praise Him and thank Him that He lives in us. And then right after worship, we're going to celebrate Daniel and John Luke's birthday with a cake in the back. And you can have your cake and eat it too. All right? So let's worship the Lord.